So, yo, and the recording is started. Love that. That's hey. perfect. And I didn't do that. He did it on the, on its own. It's perfect. <laughs> we love it. We love all the magic stuff. Yeah. We want to start letting people works. in while we're waiting for a few more minutes. Yeah. That, uh, we have a couple of people here. Yeah. Ah, I see what happens. It's the guys on on our that that are the chapter leaders that get the host. Yeah. Back. That's why me and Mindy have yeah. me and I have the the host rights. Got it. Got it. Makes sense. And let me give present the rights to Bobby as well for when Bobby presents himself. Sure. So we have a hello from Brazil from Ricardo. Hey, Ricardo. Hello. And I don't know if anybody right. else. Is, is, let, me, let me do it right. It's obrigado, right? Is that right? Yeah, obrigado. Yeah. Yeah. So obrigado to you, Ricardo. I did it. I remember the one word I remember from my trip. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty useful, I will say. Yeah, usually it's the one that uh, you, you need to know. Please and thank you. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. The the problem I ran into is and I'm sure this is pretty common for for your classic like traveling like touristy stuff is I took 2 years in Spanish in high school and my yeah. brain tried to switch to that I'm like no it's wrong like you that's not that's yeah. not what's happening. <laughs> they call false friends where it is the same word with different meanings. Mm. Oh, that's dangerous. Yeah, very dangerous. Kind of reminds me of Japanese, where like the same like kanji is like these are three different meanings. You know, like face off of what's around it. You're like, okay. <laughs> I was already asked in the past if learning Spanish for someone that is Portuguese native uh, is easier than learning English, and I, I disagreed just because of the the false friends. Yeah, I think for sure, it's a different language, right? Yeah. Different vocabulary and, and all the tests. Okay. okay, so I think we can start. We we'll give our our five minutes. Sure. Go to join. So, hello everybody. Thank you for coming to our meetup uh, presentation. Uh, we are glad to have Jacob here to help us understand a little bit more about processes for enterprise architects. And before we start, I'm just going to show a little small presentation to tell you who we are and uh, what we do. So do you see a presentation, PowerPoint presentation? I or do not. Oh, I love those stuff. So let me try again. Let me share my, my entire screen. There. Sure. Maybe it's permissions related. Oh, I cannot share from a Mac OS for some reason. That's weird, because I, I have one. <laughs> grant, grant access to share. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> uh, one so second. Doing it live. Talk amongst yourselves. In, uh, right, exactly. <laughs> I know we have someone from Brazil uh, um, in in Ricardo. Where's everybody else from? I guess I'll answer my own question. Uh, I live in Jacksonville, Florida, actually. I guess I can come on. Yeah. What's up, Bobby? Yeah. Uh, I am from the Dallas, Tex Dallas, Texas area, which it has been storming like crazy around here today. Really? Yeah. 
kind of not a surprise. We didn't expect, or I didn't expect it. I haven't been checking the weather, but it's been blistering hot up until today. So I can't relate. He said, joking. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Elise from New York and uh, Selena from Moline, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Illinois. Very cool. Okay, so no presentation. We're, no? Uh, yeah, no. Been whack? Cool. I have to go up. Go sure. out and back and do. so, but basically, so let me present our sponsor for this webinar yeah, um, meetup. So, NT Consult uh, is the company that I work for. Uh, we are a um, software development company, we are full stack, and we are also big partners with Camunda. We are one of the main uh, partners for Camunda in North America, and we are the main partner for Latin, Latin America. And we work in uh, near sharing. So uh, whoever works with us, we are uh, we accommodate to get have the same time zone as the US and Canada. So we don't have to worry about that stuff. And presenting us now that they are here, uh, I'm Emilio. I am a senior Camunda business architect. And since two days ago, I'm also a Camunda 8 certified developer. <laughs> Thank you. Bravo. And as I mentioned, I work with NT Consult. I also help in pre-sales. So any needs that you have for understanding your needs or doing a POC, you can reach out to me or to Mindy, who is in the chat as well. And we have Jacob Blick here, which is our presenter, but I will skip him because he will present and go directly to Bobby. Bobby, please. Yeah, you can do it real quick. Thanks so much, Emilio. Uh, Bobby Chapman. I am the Camunda account executive responsible for uh, the South. So I've, I'm based in Texas, um, born, raised, and everything in, in the Texas area um, or in Texas. I am what Jacob likes to call boomerang. Lots of people call me that. Uh, Bobby Boomerang. I'm a boomerang. <laughs> I had this is my second tour with Camunda. I worked with, at Camunda from 2020 to 2022. Left and went to another company. Realized it was not as great because Camunda is awesome. And now I'm back. I've been back for about three months. Um, I'm here to help answer any questions or direct you in the right direction for anyone that has uh, questions today or follow-up questions we can't get done, you know, live on the call. And yeah, just excited to to see the presentation here. So Jacob, take take it away. Sure, let me give it a whirl myself. Excellent. All right. Um, classic, you know, meetup question number uno. Can everybody see what's going on? Yeah, we can see. Okay, it. cool. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah. <laughs> I was just like, wait a second. All right, cool. So, uh, so yes. So, presentation wise, again, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about. Press orchestration for enterprise architects and how your architecture overviews. Uh, so as previously mentioned, uh, my name is Jacob Plick. I'm a senior developer advocate at uh, Camunda, pretty focused on building content and community for uh, enterprise architects. But this isn't this presentation isn't just for them, uh, which we'll get into a lot of the different stakeholders and, and people here in a bit. Uh, and in previous lives, I've spent a lot of time doing solutions architect work, operational excellence, uh, site reliability, engineering. Uh, I feel like I've done almost everything that I've ever wanted to do um, and uh, really love spending time um, communicating and building content uh, for folks like yourselves. So uh, welcome. And uh, as previously mentioned, I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, we like to yell uh, our county name, uh, Duval, really loudly in the streets. Uh, that's not an exaggeration, I promise. Uh, and a fun fact about me is I'm a huge nerd. I love tabletop RPGs like Dungeons and Dragons. I have a desk collection in the thousands. It's becoming a storage uh, hassle, but you know, first world problems. So let, let's get into it. Uh, so first up, Agenda-wise, I'm going to take you back to uh, a story of my cloud engineering days in 2016. We'll talk about what enterprise, actual, uh, enterprise architects do, the challenges that they run into, how process orchestration helps, and then uh, how we take it from a project to scaling something at the enterprise uh, level scale. Now, I'm presenting uh, with a full screen here, so I won't see questions coming in, but I'm planning on spending some time afterwards. Uh, so if you want to jot those down, I'm happy to spend some time to, uh, to go over it. 
So I first became a cloud engineer about a decade ago. I remember being very excited to learn. Uh, and I remember one of my onboarding exercises was to meet with the architect on our team. I remember he walked up to a whiteboard and walked me through what all of our services looked like at that classic 10,000 foot overview. And I remember bombarding him with question after question after question. How does this work? Where is this documented? When's the last time we tested this failover scenario? And he just shrugged with a grin and showed me some outdated documentation and, uh, and sort of taught me through it, which is when I realized a lot of this lived inside of his head. So what do architects like that do anyway? So even though I had an in, like engineer in my title for the first time that week, it was actually an even bigger dream of mine to have the word architect in my title. From a while back, probably around the time of the convos I mentioned earlier, the way that uh, he studied and visualized everything, creating solutions to unplock teams and the many tools that he had in his uh, utility belt, if you will. Um, he's he was constantly thinking, or in this case, someone else, she, they, constantly thinking about the bigger picture and how everything moves while staying focused on the mission at hand, an architect mindset. So, but enterprise architects don't just look at IT architectures. They need to understand the company's mission in sufficient detail to make informed purchases and architecture decisions across the enterprise. Also, enterprise architects commonly make high-level design choices on all things IT and propose technical standards, including things like coding standards, tools, or platforms. The reality of an enterprise architect is every day you drive change by tying the business and IT landscapes together. You consistently translate the needs of the business to IT teams. And while they may have difficulty getting on the same page in many, in many situations, you sit right in the middle of it all navigating the organization towards success. It's pretty common to whiteboard a diagram kind of like this. Uh, what's interesting is the picture before and the picture now uh, was taken about seven years uh, uh, in between each other, many, many companies later. And also this was also from the top of the VP of engineering's head as they walked me through the infrastructure of our platform on my first week at this new job. So as you can see, and don't, you know, don't zoom in or anything like that. There's a lot of uh, different acronyms and business justification of decisions that were had in this meeting uh, that I was talked through. But of course, none of that information, that justification is up there. So again, where is that documented? There's no way to measure the value of what's on this whiteboard as it ties back to the business. So let's talk a little bit about the tools that um, enterprise architects have at their disposal. So uh, we have visual diagrams kind of like that, uh, visualizing what your systems look like via a series of images that tie your infrastructure and applications together via real world scenarios, if these exist, that is. This collaboration, creating collaboration between the business and IT teams, like we talked a little bit about earlier, ensuring that everybody's on the same page. Expertise, most architects have an incredible amount of expertise. Um, pretty common to see somewhere upwards of 10 plus years sometimes. Uh, data distribution and data flow. How does data flow from one application to another? What dependencies are there? Performance benchmarking. What is the behavior of our systems when things are running well? When do things begin to fall over as we hit a certain amount of traffic? So knowledge of best practices too. Best in class security, API gateways, event driven architecture, microservices, choreography, you name it. So the opportunities are pretty endless here. But meanwhile, at the Legion of Doom, for architects, it's not about how many tools are in your tool belt, but how and when they're used. The business folks don't necessarily care about the nitty gritty work that the IT team is doing to, let's say, create horizontal scaling across a variety of different servers. What they do care about is the impact that those decisions have on the rest of the business, as well as their customers. Your customers' expectations, by the way, have never been higher. Immediate gratification, little to no patience whatsoever. I actually read somewhere recently that most consumers will only give a business two to three chances before leaving them forever. And honestly, in my mind, I was thinking at the time, try one with the additional um, support uh, of a negative Yelp review, for example. So to the business side, it feels like IT is ignoring the needs of the business. 
And to the IT side, it feels like the business side doesn't respect their workload. And guess who lives in the middle of that friction? The enterprise architect, you. Like in this case, like Spider-Man holding a bus on one side and a train on another, you have to balance both of their needs while also driving home really important business value. Meanwhile, how's that documentation look? Are those visualizations up to date? What's missing? How about those fillover scenarios again? Just a zoom in of that, that previous slide. Enterprise architect in the middle trying to do it all, save the world. But um, one thing that's really interesting is Biz Design. Uh, this is a company out of the Netherlands that does um, a lot of business uh, process management or yeah, business process management and enterprise architecture. They put out this really excellent state of the enterprise architecture report earlier this year. And it states that enterprise architects need to marry those expectations with the rising need to cut costs while also driving the conversation between business value and IT implementation. So things could get pretty messy. As these requirements change rapidly, IT teams start saying no, choosing to go their own way. This stat was pretty wild to me. Less than 30% of the respondents to that report fully agreed that their enterprise architecture practice delivered business outcomes, such as better business insights, identification of, of innovation opportunities, improved customer experience, and faster time to market, uh, which leads me to believe that that's probably a place that they're not going to invest in much more. All while there's the big word that a lot of people are scared of, change. But the reality is change is inevitable. It's incredibly challenging to take advantage of the technical innovations of our time without it. Not to mention, it's difficult to deliver that digital transformation that almost every company is attempting to deliver to keep up with their competitors without full visibility into their environment. So where enterprise architects come in really effectively is balancing the needs of the business and the IT implementation helping break down a lot of those barriers, sort of being this interpreter between both of these groups. But again, what's missing? It's the fact that it relies solely on the knowledge of said architect to tie so many things together, uh, both technically while also attempting to manage the relationship between the business and IT while driving home, again, value across the board. So that brings us to process orchestration and where I think that this can help. So what is it? Process orchestration coordinates the various moving parts of a business process, sometimes even tying multiple processes together. It helps you work with the people, systems, and devices that you already have, also while achieving even the most ambitious goals around end-to-end -end process automation. Uh, so at Comunda, for example, we really, really focus on business process orchestration, which we believe results in process automation. So the power of process orchestration is that it allows those enterprise architects to connect the business and IT stakeholders together. It's showing not just the stakeholders, but the entire organization that we can do a lot of things, like visualize what's actually happening. As much as we love those whiteboarding meetings that try to explain all the moving pieces, it's likely that's what's drawn and what's actually implemented aren't the same. But with process orchestration, that's no longer the case. What's designed is exactly what's implemented and executed. Then a big one, business and IT speaking the same language, aligning business and IT using a common standards-based model and language. We'll talk about this in a, in a little bit more later. Taming complexity. You don't need to eliminate complexity. Instead, you can tame it by having thorough end-to-end -end orchestration across your customer journey. And then lastly, driving home business outcomes. Organizations are more likely to invest in architecture teams that uh, support the enterprise if they can drive home value to the business. So with process orchestration, when you're doing it, it's much easier to have that tie the to, to tie the business and IT value conversation together. Okay, great. How do we get started with all this? First, let's talk a little bit about BPMN, which uh, stands for Business Process Model and Notation. You can actually build one model across the entire customer journey using this, uh, which is, by the way, the ISO standard for modeling and execution. And you can visualize how all your processes perform. You can detect bottlenecks with really uh, fairly easily, get notifications about errors, and then using things like machine learning to recognize patterns or dive into heat maps to see what's really happening. 
I know some folks here likely use this already, but just in case, I want to make sure everybody's on the same page. What's interesting is if you're not familiar with BPMN, um, you might be and not know it. Uh, so this is a fairly common walkthrough uh, of a fulfillment center. You see a order, a payment service, inventory, shipping. Um, this actually comes from a blog post I wrote five years ago talking about the reliability of a, of a fulfillment center and talking a little bit about Kafka. And if you're just learning about what PMN is or you've used it, you might recognize some of the symbols here, even though I didn't five years ago, ironically enough. Now, this is a much larger diagram. It's actually a blueprint we're going to uh, release on the Comunda website here uh, in a little bit um, about the telco, uh, using a telco order fulfillment um, sort of system uh, as an example. Uh, and a quick shout out to Till Stadler on our consulting team for putting this one together. So when we start to zoom in at some of these pieces, we start to see areas that we can collaborate using BPMN as we start to think of our systems in different ways, not just infrastructure and applications, but processes uh, in which our customers both internal and external interact with. Um, I remember an old mentor of mine, actually right around the time of those initial pictures uh, at the beginning of the presentation, he would always say to me, respect production. It's where our customers live. But I actually think it's right here in these processes. So whether you're looking at something like mobile provisioning or customer data management or how a service order is received, all of these have these different miss, you know, not missing, different pieces uh, of which to drive home value. And it allows us to have a conversation across the entire journey. All right. So we've got one process down, but where the heck do we go now? So uh, process orchestration, keep in mind, is not just automating workflows or visualizing uh, a flowchart. True process orchestration has that executable BPMN, end-to-end -end visibility, and an open architecture. So we actually provided a strategic orchestration approach that should be applied to every project that you want to kick off. That way, you can strategically position the new project into the existing process landscape, whatever that might be, build new processes with a really strong customer focus, and then you can define and measure process KPIs from day one. That also allowing you to prove value of the orchestration process really early. So let's start with how our approach should be. Let's locate that process, the newly to be orchestrated process on whatever landscape you're using. This allows you to easily find the start and end point of the process and helps to follow and benefit from other industry standards, for example. Then we get to, whoop, make sure you got things caught up here. There we go. Define different, not different, define customer touch points. When you detail that process, you wanna make sure that it has customer facing events in it. Like for example, do we have all the needed customer documents obtained? It's a good, a good point to think about. What about when you create a quote for a, a mortgage or uh, some sort of pricing uh, event? Then defining the process goals and the KPIs. You can create a process profile that describes the process and defines the goals and the KPIs. So you can derive process goals from the given business strategy like let's say reducing cost or increasing quality or accelerating a timeline and then define KPIs to measure those goals. So you wanna think about defining internal targets that use or use industry standards as thresholds for those KPIs, depending on the industry that you're in. An optional piece, but no less important, you wanna validate the business case with some level of tracking that can be used to calculate and process different KPIs based on existing system events, like as an intermediate step before you orchestrate the process. And then orchestrate the process. And then you can continuously improve from there. So most often we see approaches similar to this when we start to think about typical uh, project life cycles. Now, of course, even though the approach shown here, this visual here appears to follow uh, a straight line, that's not really, for the most part, it's almost never the case in real life. So there are solutions uh, here that are best created in like an agile fashion. Uh, continuously, you want to continuously deliver business value in small iterations if you can, and 
you don't want to be following things like rigid waterfall models, for example. So the strategic model is a model purely expressing the why of a process on the business level without too many operational details, whereas the operational model is a shared model between business and IT. This is actually the power of BPMN, by the way. You don't need two disconnected models for business and IT, but rather you can have one joined operational model. Now, of course, you might end up with multiple physical copies of that model. So for example, one in the collaborative modeling tool, one in the company internal wiki, one in the version control of your IT solution, and that's fine. And we'll describe some steps later on um, that might make this a little easier. So let's go through some steps in this solution creation approach um, piece by piece. So discovery. Very often, this is a step that's not really part of a solution project, actually. Uh, typically, you have to evaluate some level of process candidate for orchestration and then consider the resulting business case first uh, in order to come up with some really concrete next projects. But the aim of this discovery phase is to identify a process to orchestrate and define the business case for the automation project. Then capture business objectives and define success metrics. It should be pretty clear not only why a process should be automated, but which metrics will actually define the success of them. These could be, for example, cycle times, uh, reduced amount of human work, increased sales through better customer experiences, for example. Um, and this step is really overlooked in uh, a lot of our experience. So it really makes it hard to communicate value much later, but also misses an opportunity to align everyone on a common goal, which is a perfect segue into defining ownership and roles. So before kicking off a solution, you really want to understand how it's connected with the business domains that are holding the use case together. Um, so you really want to advocate for something like clear process organ, uh, ownership, for example. So the model itself, the model you create should be clear, understandable, and precise, as it'll be the basis for the executable process. Although the primary focus should, of course, be on the process to be, uh, is this is where the value will come from. It's often helpful to capture the as is process first so that you get the ground running, so to speak. And you also make sure that you better understand the changes needed to implement the new process. Developing, for example. Next up in the development of the solution, which means adding all the technical details needed to make a process model executable, um, to make it alive, so to speak. Uh, this can involve different expressions to implement decision points. Uh, we see these like as like different gateways. Uh, glue code to integrate different service calls, configuration of connectors. Uh, development, by the way, should also include writing automated tests, at least for solutions with a certain level of criticality. Run. Uh, solution will only generate business value, of course, once it's running in production, when it's interacting with the real world, for example. So this, of course, will be including things like setting up a deployment environment, um, or and this is probably handled by some sort of service owner or your SaaS vendor or an internal uh, team, like a center of excellence, for example. So before you put your solution into production, really important to consider some level of change management for the people that will be affected. So for example, if they'll need to switch to using this new task management UI or otherwise change the way that they do their work. Monitor. So once it's production, once it's in production, I should say, you should continuously track the value. Make sure that you're implementing automatic capturing of these KPIs that you define at the start of the project, probably via a process intelligent tool. We'll talk about that a little more in a second. And you wanna have a press orchestration platform that'll help you automatically capture all relevant data and provide uh, real-time dashboards for your executives. Ultimately, this is a really complex transformation journey. And it's a team effort across the whole organization to decide to go this route, right? So it's really crucial to align everybody's expectations. So let's think of the diversity of the stakeholders that we're talking about in a couple of different dimensions. So on this vertical dimension, we have personas according to their strategic and operational focus. And so we want to think about the C-suite, for example, acting as a governing entity across all the domains. Uh, strategy focused stakeholders usually define the vision and provide the budget, while operational stakeholders execute it. 
in that sense, it's really important to link the strategic goals of the organization to the initiative. And then think about how you can not only enable operational stakeholders to drive adoption across the organization, but also amplify their voices in order to generate a flow of fresh ideas and make sure that there's valuable experiences that are leveraged for further, further improvements. Now, alongside the horizontal axis, we distinguish IT and business stakeholders, as well as the multiple dom domains across the organization. So for now, this distinction is really helpful to understand the different focus points, mindsets, and motivations. In some digitally mature organizations, this distinction is eroding. And that's actually a good thing. Um, because in order to deliver business value at scale, uh, in reality, in many cases, they're still operating as different entities when they need to be aligned. So if you're targeting an enterprise transformation initiative, whether it's press registration or something else, it's really important to have a shared understanding in the C-suite about the potential of the technology that you're using and how it ties into the business strategy. And this really helps to ensure things like necessary funding and leadership to drive the change that you want to do. Continuing to your senior VPs, your line of business leaders, your directors, it's really, really important to understand their goals and challenges and to make them aware of the value a transformation like this holds. And then you'll typically start with like a few use cases and a few domains, one to three probably, and you wanna focus on those leaders first, so it's not to overstretch your capacity. But of course, you should always be open to talking to anybody that's interested in talking to you about the value of process orchestration. Now, from a maturity perspective, this is a, a methodology we introduced a year ago in uh, Comunicon, New York, almost a, almost a year ago to the day, I think. Um, and this maturity model is a tool that helps uh, establish um, from a community perspective, uh, and and validate, validate the long-term value that a dedicated process orchestration practice can deliver to a business, or, uh, business organization. So five stages. So no process orchestration at all. Uh, number one, in this case, being a single project. So we want to think about adoption in a single project where a team might be a proof of concept, a broader initiative. So we're talking multiple initiatives in one domain, like like a health insurance department and an insurance company may be orchestrating multiple processes, for example. Distributed adoption. Now we're talking multiple domains with multiple initiatives. So using that same example, health insurance and also life and let's say composite insurance departments that are strategically using process orchestration. And then lastly, strategic scale adoption. Now we're talking multiple end-to-end -end customer journeys across domains, automated intentionally throughout this like holistic enterprise strategy. If you want to dive into the details of this, um, let me know. Uh, we actually have a website that introduces specifically the maturity model and dives in really deep here. So I just wanted to introduce it to you. So from an enterprise architecture and then kind of showing how process orchestration can be like this glitter glue for business capabilities to form these processes, you want to first concentrate on end-to-end -end customer journeys that ensure that you don't get lost in these internal details that don't really matter to your customers. And then secondly, this approach allows for things like flexibility. So you can easily adjust how these processes work, add new requirements, and then automate and improve them step-by-step -step using the model that we talked about a little earlier. This also allows you to introduce completely new business models or customer journeys as you need to. So you can see here that the end-to-end -end process is uh, kind of this like elevated concept in this drawing, but we don't want to have layers in our business capabilities. So like, how does this go together? This is a pretty pragmatic route here. And this visualization really likes to emphasize the important role of these end-to-end -end processes and how they're defined and how there's a relationship to those customer journeys. But you can also change the viewpoint if we dive into different business capabilities. So if this visualization doesn't work for you, no big deal, don't use it and just talk about business capabilities. But if you want to communicate, let's say, in end processes as first class citizens, you can do this and it'll also work. In both situations, both approaches are pretty valid. So they're just different perspectives on the same reality. So it just depends on 
adjusting your communication strategy based off of the audience that you're talking to. So um, I'm not gonna dive super deep into all of the different pieces of this particular slide, um, but of course you wanna define a roadmap to fill in certain aspects. So for example, something like a business intelligence integration can come at a later stage and like encryption might not be super duper important to your first processes if they don't include sensitive data. But let's talk about the core process orchestration capability. Uh, in this case, the workflow, um, or one major piece of it being the workflow engine, the heart of the platform. So it's responsible for defining, managing, and executing the sequence of tasks or steps that you const that constitute the process and automate it. There's also the decision engine. Uh, we didn't talk about DMN uh, today, but thought I would toss it out as a really important piece. Most orchestration platforms can also execute decision logic in the form of those decision tables in DMN, which allows for uh, things like, allows decisions to be automated based off of things like predefined rules uh, and conditions, for example. So technical operations uh, around tooling for discovering, uh, analyzing, and solving problems in regards to process execution. Um, in the case of community, that's our our operate piece. So a good example of this is imagine there's a problem with like a service call to your customer relationship management system. So first you'll need something like a, some monitoring piece to recognize that problem. Uh, see why incidents, for example, are piling up, send alerts or integrate with an existing application performance monitoring tool, like your data dog, your new relics, your honeycombs of the world, and make sure that the right person gets notified quickly. Of course, alerting, making sure that there's some level of uh, post-incident analysis to help you understand uh, the problem at hand and then fix it. Yeah. Of course, graphical modeling, really good BPMN modeling tools are really important for all of this. Some accelerators, we wanna talk a little bit about some templates there. There's a lot of possible valuable templates. Um, I mentioned one um, a little earlier and some connectors that are really great ways to accelerate projects as they bundle that glue code I touched on a little earlier for different places of integration, whether that's, you know, a technical product, protocol, technical uh, words, technical product pro, uh, protocol, there we go, connectors like a uh, REST API, uh, Kafka, things like that. Quick point around process intelligence from an analytics perspective. Um, so we talked a little bit about monitoring technical operations and fixing those, but we haven't talked about the business stakeholders and how they want to, uh, or need to, I should say, monitor and improve processes. So these folks are really interested in the overall perf uh, process performance and the impact that it has on the business. That's actually where our optimized tool really fits in there. So of course, real life, as we've talked about many times today, it's a bit more complicated than those architecture diagrams that are really simple, but it, it shouldn't stop you from drawing things in a simplified version like uh, like these, if it's really helpful to communicate the vision to your internal stakeholders, for example. So you really want to think consciously about the scope of those capabilities. So typically there's technical capabilities that are used by multiple development teams in the organization uh, as the technology is really typically domain agnostic. And the business capabilities are implemented for the business domains and they should be owned by the business departments. So like you wanna think about it from like a solutions scope, but commonly there's like this still a, a group in IT that owns an application or microservices that implements a business capability. And that's fine. There just should be a clear owner on the business side uh, collaborating closely with, within IT. I'm kind of speeding up a little bit uh, just for sake of time, but and not a, uh, not in not a sales guy, leave that to Bobby, but a lot of the things I'm talking about, of course, needless to say, fall within um, community's um, purview, so to speak. So having a universal process orchestrator, having uh, open standards for um, helping IT teams and business stakeholders collaborate, giving software developers the flexibility to use whatever programming language, tool, practice, whatever you wanna do, uh, providing connectors and uh, that allows you to orchestrate those processes across all those endpoints that you have and doing it at scale. 
and I'll kind of skip ahead here a little bit. So I want to be conscious of time. There we go. So let's talk a little bit about a roadmap. This is a pretty common place of, uh, not contention, but a, a pretty common place of which to think about. So we can distinguish three phases in, and this it could probably be used whether it's price orchestration or something else around building strategic adoption for anything in an organization um, as it is developed into like a enterprise work stream. So discovery, delivery, and scaling. So during the discovery phase, enterprises can conduct evaluations and strategic planning to assess the viability of something, in this case, process orchestration. So this will typically involve executing proofs of concepts to identify like a really good tech stack, aligning different objectives with organizational goals, and then developing a roadmap for that uh, enterprise journey. So from a discovery phase, you want to think about five steps, uh, assessing your current operation approach, defining your target state and scope, identifying solutions and use cases, and then building a roadmap and a timeline, and then executing on it, delivering first solutions, then building a platform and the required skills from there. Then from a delivery perspective, organizations focus on implementing process orchestration solutions. So they design the architecture, let's say they set up the chosen platform, maybe it's Kamunda, and initiate those first use cases. Then like maybe they have a center of excellence that might be heavily involved in those first projects to really get things off the ground and help with successful implementation to create a learning effect for that team. Then from there, after you've got that initial groundwork, a few additional domains, again, one to three probably, start to adopt that uh, process orchestration and then lay the groundwork for scaling up orchestration efforts, which leads us right to that. So during the scaling phase, there's more delivery work streams uh, that are added that then expands process orchestration across the organization. So this is where we enable enterprises to maximize the benefits of orchestration. That's where you start to see that efficiency and that agility improvement. Then there's that refinement uh, of a continuous nature, optimization, uh, and that's really where it starts to, you start to see the alignment with evolving things like business needs and then driving that ongoing improvement and innovation. Now across all phases, it's really important to provide ongoing communication to all of the relevant stakeholders and value tracking for those initiatives through things like monitoring corresponding KPIs, for example, for those specific use cases like uh, achieved efficiencies or at the enterprise level, where maybe we're talking about a number of use cases in production or a number of business cases handled. So that communication could happen through internal events like uh, community meetups, which are some of my favorites, uh, blog posts, if you have like an organizational like intranet, uh, your confluence, things like that, or having direct conversations between the team that owns this, in some cases like a center of excellence and the business leaders. And then from there conveying a really achieved value is really important here. And then you can build, you're building that process mindset and then generating that fresh flow of new initiatives that we talked about a little earlier. Then from there, sharing lessons learned, best practices. And from there, you're really helping development teams for the future. So change, right? Very scary. But if we wanna do that digital transformation that we keep hearing about, we need this to do digital transformation. We're thinking IT enabled transformation of these really, really core business processes to address customer needs better while reducing costs and uh, which is top of mind for everybody and then managing risks. So this isn't one of those like triangles where you can only choose two and forget the third. It's not one or the other, but all of them, like three birds with one stone. Of course, it doesn't happen in one day or 10. It's a journey to sustain the enterprise business value in the long run. And as you can see, we've been talking about this for a little while. So a lot to throw at you. Happy to uh, stick around and answer any questions. But basically, focusing on visualizing and implementing the truth, business and IT on the same page uh, is really the beginnings of what makes this really, really, really stick. And then if like a lot of that was oh, that was a lot and you're like, okay, cool. I don't remember how to get started. Think about a top level strategic diagram. 
That's a really, really great place to start. Then model the business process, then dive deeper, but making sure that you have a business outcome in mind the whole way through. Now, there's a lot of content uh, that we have on the Comunda uh, website. One thing that I wanna, I wanna throw out there is uh, just recently, uh, actually a couple of days ago, we, uh, we actually have our Twitch channel called Orchestration Hour, and we did BPMN battles. Uh, I hosted this last one on Tuesday, and uh, it was really, really fun. Uh, we put together prompts that these two people uh, don't know about, and then um, see which has the better BPMN uh, model output. Um, it's ridiculously fun in a way that I didn't expect, actually, um, but kind of surprising in a way. Um, and then from there, we've got a community academy, which you can sign up for. Um, and there's, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Emilio, I'm sure you used a lot of this when you were getting your uh, certification. Congrats again, by the way. Uh, and of course, we've got our community forum and uh, we've got business folks there, devs, enterprise architects, you name it. Uh, join the community and uh, have a good time. And lastly, uh, I wouldn't be remiss if I didn't mention uh, CommunityCon uh, in New York or online. Uh, I'll be there uh, mid-October uh, and uh, lots of exciting stuff to be announced and to learn from there. So long story longer. Uh, again, thank you for listening and I hope that was super helpful. Uh, if not, let me know. Totally cool. Uh, if so, also let me know. Um, and you can find me on LinkedIn. You can email me, uh, Duval King Jacob, all over the socials. So with that, that's just the beginning. So questions, comments? Okay. comments? We, we do have a question from yeah. Salim. If we have a complex model which contains several sub-processes, sometimes it is difficult to get the over picture of the process as we need to navigate through multiple sub-processes to understand the holistic process. Agreed. Is there any way Kamunda can handle this by generating a document like application document with more granular details, entity relation document, and data model document, which might be useful to business and new developers in the project? Hmm. That is a really interesting, really interesting question. Hmm. <laughs> the, the, the classic architect answer is, is I, it depends. Um, but I, I think that could be something that's really, really interesting. I'd love to get uh, my hands on the process that you're talking about and sort of dive into the, the sort of the nitty gritty in that regard. Um, mm. cause that's something that I have not, uh, I've not seen myself, but of course I'm in like day, I was telling Emilio day, like 87 of my community yeah. time. Um, yeah. so, but, <laughs> but it's a, it's an excellent question. I, I understand where, where they come, they're coming from because it depends on how granular you make your diagrams, right? Yeah. If you start to break it down in too many sub processes, you can lose the 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 idea of where where you are at, at right. any moment. And how, especially if you're doing optimizer stuff like that, to yeah, really see everything becomes a challenge. Yeah, and and I think that kind of dovetails into my point earlier around like the business value, right? Like it w at what point did we sort of lose the plot, right? Like it mm -hmm. becomes. It, like if we continue to break it down and to break it down and to break it down, like what was the what was the business value of that decision? And then yeah. that that's I, I would actually like zoom out and answer that question first before I even think about like what I would do to make that easier to visualize. What what, yes. what justified that reasoning? Exactly. So I, I'm breaking this down in another sub process, but will I actually reuse this? Yeah. Or am right. I? Well, just, well anyone, uh, right? Before, yeah. What's the say, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a it's a really good question, and but, uh, but it, sorry it, that it, I sped up at the end there because I I was looking at time and I was like, oh man, I'm in the weeds. <laughs> no, but but it, but it is an interesting idea of having something uh, over the BPMN notation and the BPMN and everything that Kamunda uses that actually complements it with this sort of information that is missing from then having a really holistic. Uh, project with everything that that you need for the that yeah. uh, company that's what's it's interesting just... about this question is there's like four de four different ways I, i'm like that i could i could take it you know <laughs> but but let me hold on to that one i'm gonna i'm gonna uh circle back with you on that one Celine, if you don't mind mm -hmm. uh and that's it actually we, we don't amazing. have any, any amazing. other questions oh wait 
Uh, Salim is asking, is there any limit on the numbers of shapes we need to use in the process? I don't know what so, you mean, number of shapes. Uh, so this is a this is that's that's a really fascinating question because it it kind of dovetails into to sort of the point I was making earlier. Why is that important? This is a good question. I'm not I'm not yeah. like shutting it down, but um, when when I'm thinking about what a process looks like and tying it to business value, that's really interesting. That's a really interesting question. Okay. Well. Uh... Yeah, I guess like the TLDR is why. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Basically, yeah, why? Yeah. So if there are too many shapes in the process, then it looks unreadable. So I was checking. Sure. Sure, uh, sure, 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 sure. That makes sense. Okay. So but, but, but yeah, go ahead. PPML is not not that bad in that because it, it keeps the number of different shapes and and reusable um, events and stuff like that mm -hmm. to a yeah. minimum. So, so it is fairly readable for even someone that is not well versed in in, in bpmn yeah so if you do it in visio yeah you'll go crazy yeah <laughs> yeah no for sure for sure uh and uh you definitely run out of whiteboard <laughs> but um actually to, to fire a question back to you emilio um was any of that helpful for, for you and the concerns that you have around like uh, the pain points that you've experienced. So yeah, ju just to circle back because we talked in, in yeah, in, and, and one of, one of my questions was that uh, reaching out to enterprise architects, how how we can do that because many times we enter the company or the customer through IT department or IT yeah. guys that tried Kamunda and want to experience it. Yeah, and this is our way in, and then to expand to the rest of the company, it's a it's quite difficult yeah and but you, yes you, you do help me because you, you give me a lot of uh advantages and winnings that i can bring to enterprise architects so that they see the value of having something like kamunda in the center of their it yeah. stack so yes excellent that's great to hear because i think like the tldr of it from that because that was essentially the most of the first half of the presentation is it starts with empathy really in the in the general scheme of things right like this is what you do you're probably doing too much like i'm here to help right like genuinely yeah. right <laughs> like and sometimes that's hard when yes. you're like you have like that sense of ownership and you're like this is what i'm doing yeah. and i'm doing a great job and like we're not saying you're not doing a great job we're just saying that you probably need a little help <laughs> Exactly, but but I, I, it's not enough for me to, to as a consultant to come. Hey, I can help without bringing value to, to the table. Hundred percent, hundred percent, and this is why. Like, um, and I'm I'm sure uh, Bobby will appreciate this. Like, this is why having like someone like internal as a champion, regardless of the, I'm not I'm not saying Komunda or like observability or like it, it could be you could strike through anything. The answer is always to having is having that internal like backer, right? And identifying who that is, and then from and then uh, honestly training them, right? Because like to bring it back around to the slide around like enterprise architects have trouble like uh, with business outcomes, which is just an unreal like stat. Like that's what you're here for. Oh, uh, in that's I mean honestly that's what everybody's working for, whether you're a developer or business analyst or anything. And so if you can if you whatever you're doing is to help further drive home those business outcomes, that's the right answer. Yeah, and I mentioned uh, training that that's something that happened to us a couple of times with customers that we entered. And first thing that they that we did was train them and set up a center of excellence. For them, they start to adopt in Kamunda and start working with, mm -hmm. with Dyrons. So coming way from the beginning of setting up the infrastructure and teaching them everything mm. be so that they're ready to tackle it with yeah. our help or without our help, but they're sure. ready to go. Sure, yeah. Um, and, and totally cool, there's no further questions, but I think one of the things that I would love to, if anybody's interested, is like this, I mentioned right at the end, like this is just the beginning. Like I'm creating content specifically for this particular audience. So if you're having struggles like 
you know, Amelia mentioned, um, please do let me know uh, and uh, reach out to me. And I'm I'm always willing to to sit down with anybody and hear hear some stories. Even you, Bobby. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah. Yeah, so I think we're we're, we're done for today. I yeah. want to thank Celine for the questions. Yeah, for uh, sure. Thank Bobby for uh, helping us setting setting this up. And if you need anything from Camunda, please reach out to to Bobby. Yeah. And any any questions you have for Jacob, yeah, we you can reach out to me or Jacob directly, and we will be happy to to help you out. And awesome. if you need any help uh, with your projects, please consider MT Consult as your partner for that. OK. Excellent. And then to answer uh, Satish Kumar really fast, uh, can we access the materials? Um, I will post up the slides uh, on my LinkedIn and my, my Twitter account. Um, and I'll also give a link to Emilio for when this goes up uh, on YouTube. And you can kind of put it in the description. Perfect. Excellent. Okay. Thanks, Take everyone. Jacob. Thanks, everybody. Absolutely. I'll see you in the next one. Perfect. Bye. Bye.